Hey guys, welcome back to Fiction Technician. I'm Jane. Check out my index cards. They're blank, but by the end of this video, each one is going to have a compelling story idea on it. And these story ideas are going to be complete, meaning they have a beginning, an end, and enough information for me to decide which is most worth my time to write, which is most marketable, which is going to tell the most satisfying story, which is going to be the most fun. I'm going to show you my complete process for this and we're starting right now. There are about a million ways to come up with story ideas, but one of the ones I do enjoy is the double premise. Uh, what do I mean by that? I mean you're going to take two premises, two worlds or concepts that you think are really going to be interesting to play around with and you smash them together. A lot of popular stories are double premise stories. For example, Harry Potter is magic plus boarding school. Frozen is Snow Queen plus Sisterhood, and The Sopranos is The Mafia plus Middle Age. Uh, frequently, one of these premises is going to be something very special and compelling, like Magic, Snow Queen, Mafia, and this is how the story will be marketed, It's going how it's going to find its audience. And the second premise will be something a little bit more prosaic, like boarding school, sisterhood, middle age, and this is how the story will find its relatability and how we will understand that the characters are just like us. I don't want to imply that this is an exact formula, that you have to have one special, one prosaic. Uh, for example, Outlander is 18th century Scotland plus time travel, which is two very special and compelling premises. So there's a lot of room to play here in premise plus premise land. But the one thing we want to do is take two premises and jam them together in a way that people haven't quite seen before, something that feels a little fresh, a little interesting, and has a little bit of synergy. Step one of generating story ideas in this way. I'm just going to take out some paper and I'm going to write a list. I'm going to start with the very prosaic worlds I know, like motherhood and marriage. Then I'm going to move on to worlds that may feel prosaic to me, but may feel special to somebody else because they haven't experienced it in their own life. So I'm going to write Texas and Catholic high school. And then I'm going to move on to worlds that are outside my own experience. So they may be things I know a little bit about, or they may just be things that I think would be really fun to write about, things that kind of get my juices flowing. So I'm going to write down demons, dragons, werewolves, ghosts, dinosaurs, and fairy tales. Step two is we're going to look at our list and we're just going to try to make some connections. We're going to look for synergy, uh, but we're also going to look for weirdness, things that don't seem like they'd go together and might generate some really interesting sparks if we force them to. So, you know, looking at the list, I like demons plus Catholic high school. It seems like there's some synergy there with, you know, religion. Maybe there could be a priest character who helps with an exorcism. Um, and it seems to go with those intense emotions that teenagers often feel. Uh, and I like Texas plus dinosaurs. I'm thinking intelligent dinosaurs in frontier times could be really fun. And... I mean, World War II plus werewolves, that just kind of writes itself, right? And another thing I can do is I can riff off ideas. If I feel that World War II plus werewolves is maybe a little too obvious, I can say, well, what if instead it's World War II plus magical wolf familiars, or maybe just World War II plus magic? So now we've got our three index cards with the combinations that we found most compelling. And step three is to generate a what if from each of these. So instead of just demons plus Catholic high school, we now have what if two demons were vying for control of a Catholic high school. And instead of just Texas plus dinosaurs, we've got what if intelligent dinosaurs worked alongside settlers in frontier times in Texas? And instead of just magic plus World War II, we've got what if an American squad was sent to 
investigate and retrieve some Nazi magic during World War II. Some writers call this the magical what if. It's supposed to be the compelling question that rockets you down the road to your story. Um, but I don't actually find what ifs that magical. If I were JK Rowling and I had written what if a boy found out he was actually a wizard and got to go to a wizarding boarding school on an index card? Well, in all honesty, that card could sit in my card file for 10 years, and every time I pass it by, I think, yeah, uh, that could be cool. But it's not cool yet because it's really incomplete. It doesn't give us enough to go on. Uh, we don't know yet how marketable the story is, and we don't have enough to kind of hang on to and get our creativity going. And that is why we need step four. Step four is where we take the what if and we expand it into a story with a beginning and an end. So again, in the Harry Potter example, I would expand this to a boy finds out he's actually a wizard and gets to attend a wizarding boarding school. While there, he prevents a teacher from stealing a powerful magical artifact. Now I have a lot more to go on. That is actually a story. It has a beginning and end. It has two characters, the boy and the teacher, and it has a bunch of implied characters and settings in terms of the school. So I have enough to start noodling about it in the shower and kind of getting excited about it. But do I really have enough to assess the project fairly? Do I have an idea of how satisfying an experience this story is going to give to the reader? Not quite, and we're going to handle that in step five, which is to try to push the ending to make it more satisfying. We can do this in a couple of ways. We can add a cool twist, like the boy is mistaken about who the villain is, and that actually does happen in the book. Or we can try to connect up the problem to a chronic problem in the character's life, something long-standing and emotional that they need to deal with. So we could do this by changing our premise to an orphan boy finds out that he is actually a wizard and gets to go to a wizarding school. While there, he prevents a teacher from stealing a powerful artifact. He learns that the teacher was actually under the power of the evil wizard who killed his parents. And now we know we've got something really special, something that is going to come to a great ending and provide a satisfying emotional conclusion. I spent about an hour developing each of these what ifs into what feels to me like a compelling story. And here's what I've got. Uh, a young soldier is sent with his platoon to discover a magical potion used by the Nazis. He uses it and finds that it turns him into a super soldier, but also eats away at his morality. When he has to save a French town, he manages to recover his morality, banishing those terrible effects forever. A unpopular girl becomes convinced that the popular girls in her school are possessed by demons. She and her misfit friends do mystical battle to exorcise the demons. At the end, one of the demons begins to seduce her with dreams of popularity. And a lonely boy in a frontier settlement strikes oil with his best friend, a triceratops. When raiders find out about the oil, he must defend the town. He beats the raiders and wins the approval and love of his community. One of the great things about batch producing ideas in this way is that you wind up working on something you really love. When you produce ideas one at a time, it's very easy to get shiny new idea syndrome and feel that each idea is the best, most amazing idea you ever had. But when you batch produce, it's easier to compare and assess your ideas fairly. I could probably do a whole video on how to assess your ideas, but some of the questions you're going to ask yourself are, how marketable is this idea? Is it going to appeal to people who already enjoy my work? And how much fun am I going to have working on it? When I batch produce, I typically do five at a time. I kept it to three for the video, but more normally it's five. And I'll usually wind up with five ideas. I'm excited about five ideas I think I could really sink my teeth into. But generally, one of them will have kind of a quiet pull for me. Maybe it's not in my normal wheelhouse, or maybe it just somehow isn't hitting on all cylinders for me. And three will feel solid, and then one 
will really shine for me. That's the kind of idea that I want to spend my precious time working on, and that's the kind of idea I want you to spend your precious time working on. Normally every video ends with an exercise, but I feel like that would be kind of obvious here, so I'll just say thank you for watching, and please like this video if you feel it gave you value. Next week I'm going to be talking about how to take your ideas and flesh them out to the next level, so if that sounds like the sort of thing you want to see, be sure to subscribe and ring the bell. Thanks for watching. Tech out!